That's definitely not supposed to do that. Today, we have a 2004 GTI in the shop with what you already have seen as some right front wheel sadness. This car belongs to a buddy of mine and he brought it to me for some transmission noise, which it definitely does have. So we'll be sure to address that in the future. However, on my inspections, I found that this right front wheel feels like it's about to come off. But before we go just slapping a wheel bearing on this thing, we need to do a couple of other checks. Wheel bearings can be both easy and hard to diagnose. This one was really bad, so diagnosing it is pretty straightforward. A test drive is also part of the diagnosis. Loading up the bad wheel bearing will increase the noise that it's making. Now the way you do that is to steer the car back and forth. For example, on this car, when I turn the car left, it's gonna load up the right side of the car and cause the wheel bearing to get louder. What's weird is this one didn't do that at all. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Sometimes it does. Sometimes they fail in even weirder ways like bad wheel speed sensors inside of the bearing itself. This front wheel bearing is a Presence style wheel bearing, which means that we're probably gonna need some specialty tools in order to finish the job. But before we get going down in the comments, let me know, what's your favorite way to fix a Volkswagen? I said it that way on purpose, cause it's funny. Hand at three o'clock, hand at nine o'clock, wiggle the wheel back and forth. You can see how much movement this has. You can also do at 12 and six and wiggle the wheel there too. I'm getting about the same amount of movement out of the wheel at either spot. Before we completely condemn a wheel bearing though, we wanna check a couple of other things. We wanna make sure our wheel is tight. Your wheel nuts or wheel bolts being loose can make the front of the wheel look similar. Clearly, all those were tight. The other thing we wanna look at is our axle nut. If this nut is not tight, it's gonna really lead to the same result that we saw because when you tighten this down, it actually clamps the wheel bearing together. I don't have a torque wrench on it, but it's tight enough that I can't loosen it by hand. Also on a quick note, this is not a factory axle nut and it looks like it's probably not a factory axle. So someone's been in here before. We're gonna be taking the majority of this right front corner off with an impact gun. If you don't have an impact gun, put the wheel back on and lower the car and loosen it by hand. Okay, that wasn't very much as tight as I thought it would be. Because that felt so loose, I actually ran it back in just to double check. We still got a bunch of wiggle woggle, so we're good there. Before we get too crazy taking the rest off, we need to make sure we can push this axle back through. Sometimes they're kind of seized in there, and it's best to have all this stuff attached so it's not floppling all around on you. I'll take a punch and a hammer. We can see it's moving, so I don't need to keep going to town on it. If you're struggling with this, whatever you do, don't just go to town with a hammer on the inside. You're gonna mushroom up the head of the axle and you're not gonna be able to get the nut back on. Something else that can really help too is taking the nut. Don't thread it all the way back in. Obviously you're not gonna ever punch it back, but just thread it on like that. That seems to help with pushing the axle out. Next, we're gonna remove the caliper and caliper carrier bracket. We're gonna take this all off at the same time. So there's no need to take the caliper off of the carrier. Before you go taking this off though, make sure you have a place to secure it so you're not just flopping it on the brake line. That's bad for the brake line. Got a bungee, get some zip ties or get some of those cool S hooks for hanging calipers, whatever. I generally secure it to the spring or to the shock absorber. Another thing you wanna do is make sure you loosen them both before taking either bolt out. If you take one bolt all the way out and then go to loosen it, you're gonna swing the whole caliper and uh, maybe have a bad day. Next, we need to get our rotor out of the way. I just had mine held on with an old drain plug because our screw. That's no mas. And we need to get the three thirteens that hold the ball joint, which you can see it right there, to our control arm out. We also need to get this 16 millimeter bolt out. When you take this one out, you really need to be careful because it's got a captive nut as part of the control arm. So if this breaks or gets boogered up, you're either in for a sizable repair or you're in for a control arm. And we don't want either one of those. Looks like our GTI is probably due for some sway bar end links. Anyway, we'll worry about that another time. We'll also worry about this split seat TV boot another time. But if you're DIYing this, this is a perfect overlap. Go ahead and do them at the same time. You'll notice what happened when I went to loosen this last one, this piece slung around. That's kind of the effect you get for the caliper. Remember I mentioned the caliper, don't take one out all the way before loosening the other one. You probably want to do this one as well that way. Unfortunately, this one I usually don't think about until I get smacked in the hand with it. Then I'm like, oh yeah, I should do that too. Finally, we need to get our dust shield off. Three eight millimeter bolts. Be careful with these two because these are another one that like to break commonly. We need to get our axle out of our hub. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull this away a little bit. You can see I'm pulling it out of the control arm down here. 
may take some extra wiggling to get. What we need to do next is we need to push this axle out of the hub. Mine's able to somewhat push, might need a little persuasion. This is a common place for things to get seized. So odds are yours is not gonna come out as easy as mine just did. You can see how much orangey goodness is on here. Now, another key part, you don't wanna let this axle hang down low. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zip tie it up here like that so that it's out of our way. It gives us a little, little wiggle room for it. We'll go ahead and get our ball joint lined back up. You might be wondering, Charles, why in the world did I take that off just to put it back on? Wouldn't it have been easier just to wait? Well, you really need to get the ball joint off or the tie rod end off to get the axle out. And we really need to put it back on because what we're gonna do next is we're gonna snatch this wheel hub off. Oh wait, look at how loose it is. Wait a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I did there? 100% should not happen. <laughs> um, okay, well, that is less than I did. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that shouldn't happen. Even, a, I've never had that, 20 years, I've never had that happen like that. So what do you do if your wheel hub doesn't fall off like mine did? You have a couple of options. Here we're looking at a rear wheel bearing, and while it's a little different, we can use the same techniques. You can do like I did in this video and just carefully use a hammer to tap that off. You saw how easy mine came off, and even if yours isn't completely smoked, it should come off pretty easy with a hammer. If you're going to be reusing the hub, you need to be really careful of the ABS ring. The other option would be to rent a slide hammer from, say, Advanced Auto Parts, connect it to the wheel hub, and then just snatch the wheel hub right off. Typically, the slide hammer method is what I use when I do these wheel bearings. I'm also noticing, since I can just pull this off, let me show you what else I see. This ring right here is the ABS ring. Look at it, it's yoinked up pretty good right there. That could be a problem. It doesn't look like it was hitting, but that bit of a bend uh, is not good. It looks like, looks like there's pliers marks on it. Look right there, you can see plier marks on it, and that's right where it's boogered up. I went ahead and made the executive decision to replace it with a new one. Uh, luckily, I found this one for about 30 bucks and then another 30 bucks for overnight shipping. This kind of thing actually happens pretty regularly when you're doing a project on your car. You run into something that you weren't really expecting. So here's how I decided that it was worth going ahead and getting a new hub. One, the part was only 30 bucks and if I didn't try to get it hustle, hustle, ship, it really wouldn't be that expensive. Two, and really the more important factor is what happens if it isn't good? If I got all this put back together, drove the car, had an ABS light for a right front wheel speed sensor. I'm going back to here, which really isn't that big of a deal. The big of a deal is I also then have to buy a new wheel bearing because these, once they're once this is pressed into the bearing, pressed into the bearing, and you're not gonna get it out in one piece. This also means we have a little bit less work, less work, that's right, less work to do to put this hub on our new bearing. See, when you reuse the old hub, you have to get the inner race from your old bearing off the hub. It's not a big deal, but now we ain't gots to do that. Now you might be thinking, but Charles, I'm not replacing my hub. This is you yelling. I'm not replacing my hub. I am reusing the old one. I'll show you a couple ways to get that inner race off, right? Now, when we zoom in, we see the inner race of our wheel bearing. This piece right here, you can see that shoulder right there. We need to get this piece off, otherwise we'll never be able to press this into our new wheel bearing. For comparison, here is what it looks like without that inner race on. This is all the same diameter here. You can see this kind of sticks out. Something else you really want to look at too on your hub when determining whether reuse it or get a new one is this surface right here. Because this came off by hand, I would be concerned that this surface is actually not very good to press into our bearing. You can see it's actually pretty scored up right here. Now it might be okay, right? By the time you get it pressed in and the axle bolted up to hold it all together, this might be okay. But I would worry that this might shorten the life of our new wheel bearing. So if your wheel bearing's super noisy like this one was, or it seems like the wheel's coming off, then you probably wanna go ahead and replace the hub too. But what do you do if you need to get that inner race off so you can reuse it? There's a couple of things. Take a Dremel with a cutoff wheel and you could cut it off. Just make a cut in it and eventually it'll come off. What I would do at the shop is I would put a little slit in it with a cutoff wheel and then just 
Joint with an air hammer, you could use a hammer and chisel, and it would just break right apart. If you are gonna go that route though, you wanna be super careful and not get your cutoff wheel into the actual hub like that right there. That'll mess up the hub. You can see I cut into it on purpose. So you see what not to do. But if you do cut this deep enough and you'd wanna go down a little lower, you can then take a hammer and chisel, pop, and it'll break right off. Another way is to use some heat. There's actually a tool designed specifically for this where the hub will slide down, you can spin it, and then use a torch. It'll heat up that bearing race, and then once it's hot enough, it will expand and fall down. Looks like in our case, a little propane torch ain't gonna get it done. You're probably better off with map gas or a big boy torch. Back to our wheel hub side, what we're gonna do is clean a little bit of this grease and and expose our snap ring. If you're watching this from anywhere that actually has rust, you're like, wow, how is this 20 year old car not have any rust? Pretty dope, right? So we need some snap ring pliers. You want the kind of snap ring pliers that when you squeeze them together, they close. So we'll go ahead and go into the holes of the snap ring, squeeze that together. Now, I will tell you, that came off easier, <laughs> easier than probably most any other one ever will in the history of snap rings. So just be prepared that yours probably won't come off as easy as that one did. The right snap ring pliers help. Usually you have to take a screwdriver and fish it out along with the snap ring pliers. Our next step is going to be pulling the wheel bearing out of the hub. We're gonna do this on the car, but if you have a press, taking it off the car and doing it that way is pretty easy too. If you are the type of person that lays out your new stuff before going back together with it, I have a recommendation. Take your snap ring from your new wheel bearing kit and put it on your hub, whether a new one or an old one. If you forget this and press this in, well, then you're buying another wheel bearing to take it back apart and put the snap ring in. So I always try and put this where I can't put this on without putting the snap ring on. And I'll give you one guess on why I do it that way. You guessed it. I put the hub on without the snap ring. Once you've fooled proofed putting that clip on, it's time to dial up the tool to get the bearing out of the hub. Here is our wheel bearing removal and installation kit. Now, as you can see, there's 100,000 parts in here or whatever, 20. We're gonna play mix and match in order to dial up the right thing. For that, I like to take my new bearing. We're looking for one of these pieces that's as close to the outer diameter of the bearing as we possibly can, while being just a touch smaller. So we have some, that are real close. That one's, that one's super close. So I like this one. This one's pretty close too. So we'll keep our eye on that one. This one seems to be almost exactly the same size, but what you really want is one that's just a little bit smaller so that when we're pulling it through, we don't risk this dragging on our hub and messing it up. There's another thing that we need to keep in mind. Odds are there's a shoulder on the hub that the wheel bearing sits into. We need to make sure that whatever piece we get is smaller than that shoulder. Otherwise, we're just gonna be cranking on the hub itself and we really don't wanna do that. We don't wanna destroy our hub. So you gotta find whatever fits the best for both the size of the bearing itself and it needs to be able to go all the way through the hub. And so while this one probably isn't the absolute best size to our bearing, it's what we're gonna have to use because it fits the closest to our hub. The other two pieces we're going to need are one of these cups, and I'll show you how to determine which one you need on the car. It has to be bigger than the bearing. So obviously our bearing fits inside, it's bigger, and it has to be bigger than our other piece too. And then we need one of these back two backing pieces. They have multiple layers on it, so this doesn't really matter. You can see it fits. If we needed one of the bigger cones, we would have to use the bigger piece here. We need our bolt, we need our two washers, we need what effectively is our nut. Another quick tip on the stuff I don't use all that often, I like to write what size tools it is. This one's 32 or one and a quarter inch, and then one and an eighth. That way you don't have to dig around for the right tool, you can just grab it right away. So the cone that we decide to use is going to end up resting right on this shoulder right here of the hub. You can see this flat spot. We're gonna use that to rest our cup. Now, if you don't have that, you're gonna kinda have to make do with whatever else might work. We couldn't use this flat spot here. Maybe we could get the really big one and go here. That's not very even, so I probably wouldn't do that. You really wanna make sure you find one that just fits that spot right there. 
And as you can see, we're landing perfectly right over here. And we know the inner diameter of the cup is big enough for our bearing and the press piece we're using to pull through. So this is the correct cup that we're gonna use. Okay, let's finally get this dang bearing out of this car. So we have our long bolt with our washer on it. That's gonna be step one. The piece that we measured up to the bearing and to the diameter of the hub is next. You'll notice that it's got this raised part right here. I usually go that way for this particular part. Then we're gonna take this whole little tool. We're gonna go from the back side to the front side. You kinda wanna hold that in place. We're gonna then take the cup with the lid. We're gonna put that on. Then we're gonna take our nut piece, spin that guy on. Now the next part is pretty important. You want everything basically centered as best you can. And I usually snug it down by hand. You wanna make sure that like you're not half off of the end of the hub here, that flat spot that I showed you. You wanna make sure that you're not all weird on there. Get that snugged down, then you hold the back side. then go ahead and tighten it till that bearing comes out. What we're doing is we're just pulling the bearing all the way through the hub and it'll end up in our cup. Oh, Jesus. Decided to stop being a dum-dum. Usually once you pop it loose, it's pretty easy to get out. When it starts to get real easy, brace yourself because all this is gonna come falling out. And you don't want your feet underneath there. Ta-da! Now we have our bearing in all, I would say it's glory, but <laughs> more like all of its sadness. There we go, we did it! Time to celebrate! Just kidding, we still gotta put our new one in. Next, we're gonna clean the hub where our wheel bearing lives, or if you live in the rust belt, you're de-rustifying this whole nasty thing. So brake parts clean, get all this yuck out of there. We are gonna lube this before we press that new bearing in, but we want it as clean as possible before we do that. We don't wanna drag a bunch of dirt through our hub when we pull our bearing back in. Also, make sure you get any dirt out of the groove where your snap ring is gonna go. That'll make putting your snap ring in a million times easier. Maybe not a million, but a little bit. Like four, four times easier probably. If you need to, if this is really bad, wire wheel, clean that up real good. Not like making microchips level clean, but clean, 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 clean to make it funny. All you Rust Belt technicians grinding on rusty stuff, I have a lot of respect and admiration for you. Y'all are doing work that I'm not sure I would be into. I think that looks pretty good. Let's crash zoom and see how it looks. <laughs> I don't even know if that's in focus. There we go. Look at that. You also want to do a thorough inspection on our hub or knuckle, kind of called different things throughout the repair manual. I'd hate for you to press a new bearing into this and then there'd be a problem with this. You got to do the job all over again and you got to buy another bearing. This next part has become a highly debated topic, it seems. The repair manual calls for you to lubricate the inner part of the knuckle right here before pressing in your bearing. What's interesting is not every car calls for that. The B5 Passat, for example, doesn't. The Torre doesn't. The Mark III does, and this one of course does too. Molly Lube is what they call for, so we're going to be using Liquid Molly MOS. Two, lifelong grease, and you don't need a lot. Just a nice little coat on the inside here. Let me know what you think. Do you lube this, or do you not lube this? Now before we put our bearing in, a handful of things to pay attention to. One, you want to make sure it's clean on this outer race right here. That's where it's going to plunk plug in, press into our knuckle or wheel hub. The other thing you wanna do is make sure that you press it the right direction. For this car, it doesn't matter. It can go either way. There are a lot of cars where it does matter. Some of them will have a wheel speed sensor on the inner part, like the Torag. So if you press, it'll fit either way. It'll look the same either way. But if you press it in the wrong way, you'll have no wheel speed on that corner. Cars like the B5, five and a half Passat, the inner races were actually different diameters. The outer race, I'm pretty sure, was the bigger one. And so if you pressed it in wrong, you had the inner race as the bigger one. And that's not what you want. You want to make sure you follow the repair manual no matter what. Also something that can sometimes make this a little bit easier is to throw this guy in the freezer get it nice and cold. Some people even heat the knuckle up. That way it presses in even easier. These usually go in pretty straightforward. We're gonna be using the same kit with a couple of different tools going back together. On the back side of our knuckle is a small shoulder. Remember I said it had the piece that we were gonna use had to be smaller than the shoulder? Well, now we want one that's about the same size as the shoulder. 
And this one fits real nice right on the shoulder. So that's our backside one. For our front side one, to push the bearing in, we wanna find the piece that is the biggest piece that fits inside the knuckle. So this one, like, you can see I can move it a little. This is the biggest one that fits inside the knuckle and that's the one we're gonna use. We're kind of doing the same thing, but different, man, on this one. So we're gonna be squeezing the bearing into our hub. So we'll get our bolt, we'll go through the piece that we already put in. We'll pick up our light that we dropped. Next, we take our bearing, make sure it's the right way. Get that guy kind of started. It'll hold okay. We get that one that's just big, right? The biggest one that fits in the hub or the knuckle. We get our washer. Now for this one, you'll, I don't know if you can see that, but our nut is threaded to the end on one side and not on the other. If you go this way, you don't have to thread it in a bajillion times. Just makes it going in a little easier. Now for this one, I hate using power tools. It'll work. I'm not mad if you do it. I just don't like doing it. I do like to kind of start it by hand because we want to make sure our bearing goes in evenly. So we'll counter hold and tighten away. This should go in super easy. If you're struggling, you might be going, might be going in cockeyed. I'm barely putting any effort on this and it's just going right in. The main reason I don't like to go in with power tools is there's a distinct feel when this gets to its resting place. And I always worry with power tools, I'm not gonna be able to actually feel that. You could run it in with power tools, I guess, and then stop towards the end, but this doesn't take that long just doing it by hand. As you get the bearing closer to all the way in, slow down and make sure that your tool here isn't gonna catch the knuckle. That right there is the spot to stop. There's a distinct difference between all the other places that felt that as I was spinning that nut on to right there. It's like a hard stop. Now you can loosen that. Get your tool out of the way. Take a good look and make sure that it's in enough to where you can get your snap ring in. You also wanna take a look at the backside make sure that it's seated all the way. It's probably gonna look something like that. Your bearing now is fully pressed in and I want you to do nothing, 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 nothing until your snap ring gets installed. I know I'm making like a big stink about this, but I've forgotten it and it sucks and it's expensive. So go ahead and get that snap ring in, make sure it's seated all the way. Now you may continue with the rest of the job. We are on the home stretch. We need to get this guy pressed in next. This guy goes in just like that. Funny enough, repair manual does not call for any lube on this part or this part. You do wanna make sure that inner race is clean. I wouldn't go spraying a bunch of brake cleaner in there though. You don't wanna get that into the bearing. We're gonna kind of follow the same vibe with this as we did with the actual bearing. So the piece that you had that you used to take the bearing out, that's what we're gonna use. We wanna get that on the back. Now it doesn't have to be that exact piece, but our goal on the inside is to support the inner race. So as long as it's a little bit bigger than this inner race, it's gonna be okay. So even if we wanted to use something like this one, totally fine. We just need to make sure we support the inner race on the backside. Otherwise, you're just gonna punch it all the way straight through. It's a little harder on this style of tool that we're using, but also another mistake I've made at some point in my career. So we're gonna get that piece. We're gonna get our bolt and our washer. Next, we're going to get our last piece we're pressing in. For our outside, we wanna get something that fits flat on this piece of the hub or goes over it. Either one is fine. You don't wanna mar it up though. You wanna be careful not to mar it up. You'll have trouble getting the wheel on. We'll get our washer for the outside. By now, you're an expert at this. You know exactly how to do it. Once that is all kind of set in place, we're gonna get our tools and we're just gonna slowly run this back in. Just like with the bearing, it gets to a point where you feel a distinct increase in pressure and effort that it takes to turn it. I usually just give it a little uh, snuggy and then you're good to go. It's in. Time to celebrate. No, nope, still not time to celebrate. We gotta finish our job first and put all of our tools away. How fresh does that look? Much more fresher than that scrunchy old crusty one we had in there before. The hard part of our bearing is done. It's pretty easy from here. We're gonna start with getting our axle in. Before I do that though, I'm gonna just take a brush 
and clean up the splines. We're actually gonna be pulling this axle back out before too long, because we gotta pull the transmission in this car. That's a tale for another day. I'm also gonna get some of that molly lube that I used. You wanna be super careful putting your axle back in. I've seen technicians force the axle into the, the hub and end up damaging the axle. While the nose of the axle is repairable, you don't wanna have to. If you're doing this on your own, this is a good time to go ahead and replace a ball joint, you know, maybe a, maybe a tie rod end. This one really could use a tie rod end. For this one, we're trying to get the car on the road reasonably. So we're just, we're kind of doing the bare minimum right now. Go ahead and use the wrong pliers to cut our zip tie. Oh yeah. Look at that, slid right into its home. So we don't run the risk of that unsliding into its home. Go ahead and get this nut put on. We're gonna bolt down our ball joint. This kit comes with a pretty good amount of hardware. I, I didn't use any of it because I didn't take any of that off. Maybe it's cheating, I don't know. I feel like if you don't take something off, you don't need to take off. Why worry about it? Get our sway bar end link on. Make sure you start this one by hand. You don't wanna have to put a control arm on it because you're cross-threaded. That makes for a bad day. Ideally, the, rehabbing this entire front suspension would have been a good idea. Next, we'll get our rotor backing plate installed. That was a little aggressive. We don't have a screw for the mount right here, but that's okay. Now we can put our caliper on. I say that because I think I cut the part where I tried to put the caliper on with no rotor. That was silly of me. Let's go ahead and snug these bubbies up. There's some pretty detailed instructions about tightening up our axle nut that we want to make sure we follow. The repair manual says not to tighten this without the car on the ground. So we definitely want to do that. However, I'm going to snug it up because you're also really not supposed to put the car on the ground without a snugged up axle in it either. So kind of one way or the other. Now you also don't want to run this in with an impact gun. because We have like a nylon coating here at the end that functions like a lock nut. So don't slam it in with an impact gun. I'm just gonna go ahead and snug it up a bit. Before you put your wheel on, depending on what kind of wheels you have, you wanna make sure you take your center cap off. If you don't take your center cap off, you're not gonna be able to tighten that nut. Wheel on, snug up our bolts, and I'll come back and torque the wheel bolts as well when we get the car on the ground. For tightening the nut at the end of the axle, we wanna lower the car down so it's touching the ground. You also wanna make sure that you're positioning the car where it can't roll away because we're tightening this nut to 200 newton meters or just shy of about 150 pound feet of torque. That is our first step of tightening. Also, watch your fender, make sure you don't tear it up. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna loosen that nut one half of a turn. So I'm gonna start here about three o'clock, right there. Go 90, then another 90. That actually loosened it a lot. So we'll put a mark here. We're gonna lift the car back up and rotate it 180 degrees or one half a turn. About half a turn, lower it back down. Now we're gonna re-tighten to 50 Newton meters. 50 Newton meters is the bottom end of my other torque wrench, so I had to switch to the smaller one. If you have a tech angle wrench like this one, that'll do degrees, I need to another 60 degrees, which is two thirds of 90. So if you went 90, you'd probably land somewhere about there. So for the 60 degrees, if you have the tech angle wrench or something that does angle, use that. Now, if you don't have a way to measure angle, there's a little trick in the repair manual that you can use. And while it'll get it done for you, it's a little bit tricky to do. This is basically what our 12 point nut looks like when it's attached to the axle. If you place a dot on one of the 12 points of the nut, highlighted here as dot A, and then a dot on the wheel, two points clockwise, shown here as B, you can rotate dot A, to line up with dot B and you have turned the nut 60 degrees or one sixth of a turn. I found this difficult not only to mark the nut, but also to see where it was while you were tightening it. So rather than marking the nut, I went ahead and drew a line on the socket so that I could see it. I put my B mark on a piece of tape on the wheel and then tightened it down that way. And it worked fine. 60 degrees is a bit harder to eyeball than say 90. So this is just a little cheat code. Also important to keep in mind that you wanna make sure you double check the axle torque for your specific car. Different setups, whether it's a nut or a bolt, will have 
have different torque values, you wanna make sure you get it right. And since we're right here, we'll go ahead and torque our wheels down too. And finally, we'll put our wheel cap on. If you're the type, we'll go ahead and line it up with a valve stem. Probably not perfect, but. Something else that I always like to do once I get everything tightened up is just go back and double check my work. So we're gonna wiggle our wheel top to bottom. Remember how much play was in it before. Now there's next to nothing. And then side to side. As you see, I actually got some play still in this wheel. Not nearly as bad as it was before, but still got some play. So we're gonna take a quick look underneath and see what's going on. It feels like an inner tie rod. We're gonna have to put that on the list of things we need to replace. So if you look while I move this with my hands at nine and three, look at how much the inner tie rod is moving. Everything else seems to be in place. We definitely have a bad inner tie rod and we have no movement. If I put my hand on the outer tie rod, I don't feel any movement there. It's all coming from back that way. Okay, all that's left now is to take it on a test drive and see how she does. On our test drive, we're gonna be listening for noise coming from the right front, which is the corner we just did our wheel bearing on. In order to load up that right side, turn the wheel left just a little bit. This is gonna load up the right side suspension and generally will either make the wheel bearing noisier or cause it to go away. But most times it'll change what it sounds like. It sounds great, I don't hear any noise. To be honest, I didn't hear any noise from it the first time, mostly because we have such a bad noise coming from the transmission. I do feel some play in the steering wheel from that loose inner tie rod, so we'll have to make sure we address that too. So that seems like a good place to wrap it up. Questions or comments, drop them down below. With that, I'm out. Have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you again next time.